Today, I'm looking at pain. One fact of life that I've discovered is that we're all going to have painful moments. I think as a kid, we're a bit naive. When we're younger, we think life's going to be rosy. We think when we're an adult, we'll make the rules, everything will go our way. And life doesn't work out that way. And there's not many guarantees in life, but one guarantee I have found is you're going to have painful moments. You're going to have moments where glasses <coughs> shatter. When stuff you never thought would happen would happen. And in these moments, I think we kind of have three options. Because painful moments will come. We have three options to choose when these painful moments happen. The first is to box it up. So when we box it up, we pretend it never happened. Or we put it deep into our subconscious and we try to, you know, pack it away, not talk about it, act like it's not there. For us who are Christians, sometimes we box it up by finding our favorite verse. And just saying a verse over it, which is good to say a verse over it. But we don't actually sit with the pain. We say the verse and then we box it away and we're like, yep, it's dealt with. And then 10 or 20 years will go by and something will happen and it flares back up. And that's because that's a lot of us choose to box up painful moments. We don't like to face it. So that's one of the options we can do. The other option that we can do is we can let it define us. So sometimes we have painful moments in our life happen, things that are unthinkable, things that are really painful, and we let that become a definition for who we are. We give that painful control of our life. It begins to drive our ship, in a sense. And I think we meet people who do this. I'm sure you've all had friends who've went through painful moments, and they were horrible moments. And you've sat with them to try to support them, and they just never move past it. Right? It just defines them. Again, and again, and again, and eventually... It's not so much fun to go have a comfort with them. Because you can kind of predict what they're going to say. Because they're just stuck. They're letting the pain that they went through define them. And then another option I believe we have is we can allow it to transform us. I think this is the option that we need to choose because it allows us to move through the pain in a way where it transforms us more into what God created us to be. We all have this divine image within. And there's, as life happens, that divine image can get a bit murky. Stuff can happen to cloud. But I think if we allow the painful moments to transform us, we can kind of clean up that divine image and it shines even brighter. We become more who God created us to be, but we have to move through the pain. And I think it's really important too because Although there's the fact of life that there's going to be painful moments, there's also another fact of life that I believe pain destroys when we box it up or let it define us. I think we can see that in our society. You can see it with young adults, you can see it with kids, you can see it with older people, every generation. You can see sometimes how pain just destroys. When people box it up and pretend it's not there. Or when people let it define them and they get stuck. I believe Judah shows us that in Matthew uh, chapter 27 verses 1 to 5. So if you don't know who Judas is, he was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. One of his loved 12 disciples. Someone so trusted in Jesus' inner, inner circle that he looked after the money. Right? He was a trusted follower. He gave up everything to follow Jesus because he believed in who Jesus was. And towards the end of Jesus' ministry, what we know Judas for is betraying Jesus. And I think this painful moment that Judas did destroys him. And we read this in Matthew 27. And this is after Jesus has been arrested. It says, In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and religious leaders met and put finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. They tied him up and paraded him to Pilate the governor. 
Now imagine seeing that. If you were Jesus, you don't know what he was wanting. But imagine seeing your friend parading to God. Paraded because they know what's going to happen and he's tied up like an animal. Story goes on. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed. Overcome with remorse, he gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest saying, I have sinned. I have betrayed an innocent man. Now for me, I like to imagine the pain in Judas' voice when he's saying this. Maybe tears rolling down his face. When all of it sets in. They said to him, what do we care? That's your problem. Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Then he went out and hung himself. Now I think Judas never moved past this painful moment. And I think we see the pain destroy him in a really literal sense where he takes his own life. And I think when you sit with people who have suicide ideation or think of that kind of stuff, oftentimes there's pain there that's destroying them from the inside. And I think sometimes the story surprises me because often we have this image of Judas just doing it for the money. I was brought up believing that. You just did it for the money, 30 pieces of silver. But it doesn't add up. If we really look at the story, if you look at who Judas was, he was the one in charge of money. If you know about the culture back there and the healings Jesus was doing, if Judas is smart with money, which, I mean, we all think he is because he was the one putting him in charge. So in my mind, he must have knew something about money. You know, the church hasn't put me in charge of money because <laughs> we'd be broke in like two weeks. But... <laughs> So you must know about money, right? So if you're smart, and you got a teacher you're following who's doing healings, that is a money business back then. Judas, if he was smart and really just wanted money, he could get so much money in from the side. And also, if it was just about the 30 coins of silver, why does he feel this great remorse? Like, surely, if it's just about money and that's all his motives and he doesn't believe a thing about Jesus, he's been following around and he doesn't really think he's that cool, doesn't believe he's the Messiah, and he's going to betray him, then why does he get upset when he's doomed? Because he would have seen the same kind of thing happen with other religious zealots who raised up. Because stuff like this happened before. To me, I sometimes like to sit with, what was Judas really thinking in his mind? That it led him to throw these coins back and go hang himself. And I think to me, it's clearly not all about the money. Maybe that had a part to play in it. But I would like to propose maybe Judas was wanting God to be something for him. Maybe he was tired of following around Jesus and seeing Jesus heal and seeing these Romans treat his people like other poop and hang them on the cross. Maybe he went to his Old Testament scriptures or their Torah and was reminded of these stories of a Savior coming that was going to flip the script, that was going to kick all these people out of Israel, put Israel back on top. And maybe he was wanting that to happen. Maybe he had a little thought when the money offer came in and he's a bit enticed. He's like, oh, 30 coins of silver? I mean, I could get some stuff with that. That'd be pretty good. And then he kind of had a thought come in and said, oh, I do. Maybe if I put Jesus in a corner, maybe he'll actually start to thrive. Maybe we'll see this Savior come that I want. Who knows? That could have been going through Judas' mind. We honestly don't know. But I want to encourage you to sit with that. Whatever was going through his mind, it's pretty clear from how the Gospels play out his story that this painful moment destroyed him. And the most severe sense where he took his own life. 
And I think sometimes if we get stuck in our painful moments, if we box it up or we let it define us, we can have it destroy us as well. Might not be literally doing anything that Judas did, but it can destroy us by trapping us, stopping us from building relationships with others, stopping us from reaching out, stopping us from moving forward with our life like God wants us to. So if painful moments can have this ability to disrupt our lives so much, to bring so much destruction, how do we move through it? How do we, no matter the pain, allow it to transform us and avoid boxing it up or letting it define us? And 100% honesty right now, there's no clear three-step plan. Uh, Gabby could tell you a funny joke if you want to ask her. She helped babysit my kids last night. And I came back. I started writing my sermon on Tuesday for this week. All was great one. I looked at Peter when Peter denied Jesus three times. And then when, you know, Jesus and him have that conversation at the end, I had it. Wrote it on Tuesday, touched it up on Wednesday, touched it up more on Thursday. Friday, it still wasn't sitting right, touched it up a little bit more. Last night came and I'm sitting there and I'm like, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like this. And I'm sitting there and Gabby was having a conversation with me and I changed my whole sermon, obviously, because I haven't talked about Peter Ross until now. But I think what was struggling me with this message is I was trying to give some three-step plan to move through the pain. Now, as pastors, we sometimes struggle because we're meant to get up here on a Sunday and share a message with y'all, a message from God. And a lot of times, people want answers. Tell me the way to get through this. Tell me the answers with things. Sometimes it's really hard because there's not answers to some things in life. And there's not a clear three-step plan of what to do to move through the pain so it can transform us. And I wish I could offer you one. And I tried to this week. But I couldn't. All I can tell you is it starts with us doing what we read in Matthew 11, verse 28. And I think that's where it starts. What grows from there, I think, has to do with the individual. But if you don't know Matthew 11, uh, verses 28 to 30, I'll read them to you now. This is what we read. This is Jesus talking. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is easy. That's a beautiful scripture. Greatly encourage you to read it in the message translation, because I think his translation is pretty amazing as well. But this is where it starts. It starts with us coming to Jesus with our pain. I think too often painful moments happen and we feel that we're too dirty or we've done something too wrong or it's too messy and Jesus doesn't want to do that. So then we do like we do on Sundays when we come to church. We come in our Sunday best. Ah, here we go. So we sit down to pray with Jesus and oh, I can't let Jesus know I'm moody, so i got to be perfect. Thank you, God. I love you. Oh, you're such good with blessings. But really in our minds, we're struggling. Really, in our minds, we're like, God, what is going on? Why is there so much pain? Why don't I have a clear answer? We hide that from him. I think the first step in transformation and having this pain transform us is coming to Jesus with our pain. And he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus 
Jesus is lowly and humble in heart, which to me means you're truly embraced by Christ. Have you ever tried to share your problems or your painful moment with someone uh, this happens often when you share it with a male person because we like to fix things. But you're trying to share your painful moment, right? And they just want to fix it. Or sometimes the other thing can happen. They kind of get a bit argumentative, right? So someone starts sharing to you a painful moment. We're hearing that. Sometimes our objective is like, all right, I hear what they're going through. I need to help them see the other side. So then you become a bit argumentative, right? You start trying to be devil's advocate. And we all do that with the best intentions, but I think honestly, when we're on the receiving end of that, it never really works, does it? Oftentimes, you just leave more angry. And I think this is why we hide pain from Christ sometimes, because we feel if we go to God, He's just going to sit there and be like, Yeah, I told you, Steph. You should have listened. Why are you so stupid? Come on. That's what we have in our mind, because that's what we get met with a lot from people in society. But I think what we're met with is someone who's lowly and humble. And someone who is lowly and humble, they'll just sit there and listen. And it's funny how powerful listening can be. Go see a good counselor. And I guarantee you a good counselor is not going to say much most of the time. They'll listen. They'll listen. Because that's when transformation starts. And I think we've got to realize that we're met with the Jesus, and the reason his yoke is so light is because he's lowly and humble, and he just listens to us. He holds space for us. We talked about in communion, Gabby spoke about uh, a Savior who's standing there with arms wide open, and that's what we're met with here. And that's where transformation starts, going to Jesus who is lowly and humble. So he can truly embrace us. <clears throat> and when we do that, we unbox our pain with Christ. We unbox the painful moments we might have gone through. The painful things that we don't have answers for. The painful things that can still make us cry if we think about it too long. And we start crying with God about it. We start opening up our hearts. We start unboxing that pain. The walls that we put around to protect it where this pain just grows stronger begin to crumble and the love of Christ begins to come in. And as that happens, we learn we are more than these moments. These painful moments that happen in our life. And that can be really powerful. Just to be really honest and transparent with you guys, uh, I've battled depression most of my life. God has helped me through it again and again. But I can tell you there's some days that aren't that good. There's some days that are a bit painful. And those are the days I really need to go to Jesus. Those are the days I really need to be honest with Him. Hey Jesus, I'm a bit over breathing today. If you could help me just keep breathing, that'd be good to be honest. And then the love of Christ starts to come in and we start getting this healing. We start being transformed. So will we come to Jesus and allow our pain to transform us? Come to Jesus bearing our whole hearts and who we are. Bearing our Sunday best moments where we got everything right. And bearing our worst painful moments where we got it wrong. Because, man, there's power when we're embraced. And I think sometimes we learn so much from kids. Because we see this in kids sometimes. My daughter, who you saw at the front, Esther, oh, She's super cute. She's got dad wrapped around her finger, apparently. Uh, Caleb, my oldest, says I love her more. I disagree. I love all my kids the same. She's just super cute. But there was one night I was struggling. I've been a bit sick this week, and I had my kids 
and I had a big day at work, and like we did youth group on Friday night, there was leaders away, it was just me and Gabby, you know, we're both tired, I get them home, and I'm just ready to crash, and my kids are just being kids. And I get a bit grumpy. Just, can you just lay down and go to sleep? And I was like, I am. And Esther gets teary-eyed, says yes, and starts like trying to hold in a cry. Gideon, you know, he goes a different route where he just calls me a mean name or something and he's back under there. And I remember I just stopped for a moment and I said, Esther, do you want a cuddle? And she goes, Ooh. I gave her a cuddle. And I said, I love you. And I go, I'm sorry, I got mad, I shouldn't have done it. And just the whole night changed like that. And I think that's what's happened when we come to Christ and we tell him the pain that we're in when we're open up and we cry in front of him or we unbox everything. We're met with a savior who just says he loves us and he gives us a cuddle. And sometimes a cuddle can completely change our day. And I want to encourage you to come to Jesus with your pain so it can be transformed. And I wish I could give you a three-step process of what that looks like, but I don't think it's possible because I believe in a Jesus who wants a unique relationship with you. So that means he's going to develop an awesome way to transform that pain with you. But the first step starts with you coming to him. Being embraced by a Savior who loves you more than we could ever imagine. He doesn't care about the mess. He doesn't care about the filth. He doesn't care about your attitude on the day. He just wants you. And I think if we start doing that with our pain, that's when transformation is going to start. I want to encourage you to do that, church.